Most of our videos so far have covered things that happened right at the top of the card. The big names, the ones that a lot of people know. But this time out, I've got something a little bit different. We're going right to the bottom. In a sense. Thanks to the awesome folks from the Amigos podcast, I'm doing a video about jobbers. The folks who get pinned and paid. They spend all their time losing and that's totally okay with them. Mostly. We'll be looking at jobbers in pro res, as well as jobbers from the US. It's about half and half. It should be fun. So, let's go. If you ask most wrestling fans to name some famous jobbers, then chances are a lot of the guys they mention are going to be from the WWE. That's just the way it is. Folks like Iron Mike Sharp, Special Delivery Jones, Jim Powers, Frank Williams, Marty Garno and the like will be up there. Some of them have the odd famous moment, whether it's SD Jones losing in seconds to King Con Bundy at the first WrestleMania, Frank Williams' fantastic appearance on Piper's Pit, or Marty Garner simply being the poor sod who Triple H spiked with a pedigree in one of wrestling's most horrific looking botchers, which he actually parlayed into a brief run on the American daytime talk show circuit. Oh, don't worry by the way, that pedigree didn't actually end his wrestling career or anything like that. And of course, we can't forget the jobber who had the most character. Steve Lombardi, aka the Brooklyn Brawler. The dollar store cigar chomping New Yorker was the most prominent of the jobbers, a frequent dark match opener at pay-per-views, guaranteed to get the odd win against fellow jobbers, but always a sure loser against anyone else on the card. But my favourite, and a lot of other people's favourites, well that's just got to be Barry Horowitz. If the brawler was the top jobber, Horowitz was certainly number two from 1991 onwards. Famed for patting himself on the back and his absolutely fabulous Kentucky waterfall, Horowitz was definitely one of the best jobbers. He may well get a couple of moves in during the match, but generally he got beaten up. And he was great at getting beaten up. Seriously, an excellent seller, just as a great jobber should be. Horowitz could make just about anybody look good in a couple of minutes flat, which is why he wrestled just about everywhere. On house shows, in dark matches, at TV tapings, opening pay-per-views all sorts, either in singles or tagging with his usual partner, fellow high-level jobber Reno Riggins. After years of this, it was decided that Horowitz actually deserved a push further up the card. Why exactly? Well, it's just one of those cute little ideas. Now, unfortunately, it happened in 1995, which is quite possibly the worst year in the entire history of the WWF. Everyone's unhappy, the roster's way for Finn, the shows suck, the champions are flop. It's all horrible. Barry Horowitz making a rise from career loser to winner was at least one of the brighter spots of it all. Indeed, you may look at how hopelessly barren the roster was in 95 and see a pretty good case for Horowitz getting a bit more meat on his bones. Now, the angle of a jobber getting a shock win and finding himself in the main card wasn't exactly a new one, although WWF's previous shot at it was far more manufactured. Sean Waltman, aka the 123 Kid, was simply known as The Kid for his first few matches and presented as regular enhancement talent before he shockingly pinned Razor Ramon on TV in May 93 to kickstart his main roster one. However, he was never actually going to be a proper jobber. Barry Horowitz, on the other hand, was far more of a natural fit for this storyline. Horowitz wins didn't necessarily happen out of nowhere. Over the course of 1995, Horowitz did gradually inch his way up the card, still losing, but his matches were getting longer and longer. He even received an Intercontinental title shot in March against Jeff Jarrett, losing once again, but lasting a decent time, and looking okay in defeat. Commentary would generally play up his losing record more and more, in doing so giving him a character beyond Faceless Jobber and building him up to something until, eventually, on July 9th, we get his match against Chris Candido, aka Bodied on a Skip. Skip, in the usual 1995 mile of being a talented wrestler hamstrung by an awful gimmick, did the usual beating up on Horowitz while taking time out to heat up the crowd with jumping jacks and the like, as the commentary continued to talk about the Horowitz losing streak, until finally he went too far. As Skip indulged in some push-ups, Horowitz snuck up behind him, rolled him up in an inside cradle, and got the free count, resulting in the crowd going wild and one of Jim Ross's greatest ever calls. <laughs> Barry Horowitz sold the moment as well as he usually sold a beating, for him, defeating Bodied on a Skip on an episode of Wrestling Challenge was the single greatest moment of his life. 
The Horowitz character was further expanded upon during his time up the card as he continued to shock and please audiences. Skip, his main opponent, tried to get revenge by claiming that Horowitz couldn't last 10 minutes with him and putting money on the line, only for Horowitz to then last up to the time limit. A third player was also introduced into the storyline, Hinsei Shinzaki aka Hakushi, who also suffered an upset defeat to Horowitz not long after his debut feud with Bret Hart. His character was not so much the typical wrestler, being considerably nerdy and also being proudly Jewish, wearing the style of David on his trunks and coming out to Hava Nagila. It was all very much enough to get him over with the crowd and reaction to Horowitz's new gimmick was largely very positive. Looking back at old newsletters from the time, Lee Observer and so forth enjoyed it, considering it one of the few high spots of frankly an abominable year. It all came to a head at SummerSlam 1995 in Horowitz's first pay-per-view match, a pretty good one against Skip, going over 10 minutes. Naturally Horowitz would get the final decisive victory in the feud, although it is amusing that he still couldn't get it fully clean. After losing to Horowitz, Hakushi, previously a heel, had a bit of respect for his opponent as opposed to the derision poured onto Horowitz by Skip. He would interfere in the pay-per-view match, causing a distraction with a fancy springboard flip and allowing Horowitz to wall Skip up yet again for the victory. Cue another wild call and the sheer horror of Skip and his manager Sonny. A fine moment, one of the better ones from the show that wasn't a ladder match anyways. This was the high watermark for Horowitz. He made a couple more pay-per-view appearances at Survivor Series and the Royal Rumble, teamed with Hakushi and featured in somewhat cringeworthy Americanizing the Foreigner segments, and had a lot more extended matches, usually losing again on TV, before ever so slowly moving back down the card to where he was previously. He resurfaced in WCW in 1997, but never did too much there. They didn't even try to redo the whole Ritz win storyline for the three years that he kicked around the company before he gradually moved away from the business and towards regular life, where he still happily plows around into this day. One of wrestling's nicer guys, by all accounts. At least he gave WWF fans something to smile about during 1995, when not too many people did. Definitely one of the best jobber comes good storylines. Still, as mentioned, Horowitz wins is far from original. Indeed, you could argue that WWF were just ripping off something the NWA had done almost a decade earlier, when they did a little storyline that so happened to feature a tag team that lost constantly, but were very over with the crowds. They were indeed perhaps the originators of the losing streak gimmick, the inverse Goldberg. Every time they appeared on screen, their losing record would be hyped up more and more the larger it got. And if there was such a thing as a jobber hall of fame, they'd be right in there on the very first ballot. I am of course talking about Bill and Randy Mulkey, the Mulkey brothers. It's funny, compared to a lot of jobbers, the Mulkeys were around for a relatively short time. Really they were only in the majors, NWA specifically, for a couple of years in the middle of the 1980s. And yet the two twins had an immediately catching look, as if they were Ric Flair's less talented siblings. But in reality, they were very good at what they did. It got to the stage where all the big teams, from the Midnight Express to the Road Warriors, would have arguments as to who got to face the Mulkies on any given night. Bill and Randy took beating so well, they could make anyone look like a million bucks. And despite their losses, the NWA crowd took to them immediately. Helped even further when, during the middle of yet another loss to the Midnights, Jim Cornette on commentary sarcastically claimed that Mulky Mania was running wild. Now of course, that stuck. Mulkey Mania was now very much a fin, and even if they weren't getting any sort of push ever, the crowd still went wild for the Mulkies whenever they appeared, hoping that this time perhaps they would get the W on the board. In the end, with the losing streak at a ridiculous high of around 0 to 180, it happened. It came in an unexpected place. The NWA spent a fair bit of time hyping up a new tag team of masked wrestlers called the Gladiators, played by jobbers George South and Burt Royal. They ran vignettes hyping this new team for a month or so before they finally made their debut on TV in a 1987 Crockett Cup qualifying match against the Mulkies. They looked fearsome, they even came out to War Machine by Kiss, you know the song that Taz used. 
It looked for all the world like the Mulkies were set for another hammering, with the two gladiators dishing out a beating, ignoring the walls, and generally destroying the Mulkies. Until the unthinkable happened. Beautifully, it all happens by accident. A gladiator picks up a Mulky for another backbreaker, but as he walks backwards, he trips over the other one lying in the ring. Lateral press, and a free count that sends the commentators and the crowd into euphoria. And once again, the Mulkies celebrate as if they just hit the Powerball on the lottery. For as little practice as career jobbers get at winning, they sure know how to celebrate when they actually do win. With this victory, the Mulkies had unbelievably qualified for the Crockett Cup. Their time in the tournament would be short-lived, losing quickly in Round 1 to the team of Denny Brown and Todd Champion in what also happened to be their last tag team bout for the NWA. It is perhaps only right that the light of the Mulkey mania burnt out at their greatest moment. Randy Mulkey stuck around, while Bill Mulkey resurfaced as a jobber in WWF later in the year. The Mulkeys would team again for a couple of jobber matches in 1990, again for the WWF, and then that was pretty much it. Funnily enough, the team that they had defeated, the Gladiators, would replace them as one of the main jobbing tag teams in NWA. Still, for as short a time as they were around, Mulkey Mania pretty much did solidify the brothers in NWA folklore. They're still very much in demand on the convention circuits, they've had the chance to tell their own stories about working in the territories back in the day, and even managed to get another win in 2007, when they reunited for a victory against George South and his son. For wrestling fans of a certain age, the Mulkies may just be the greatest jobbers in the history of American wrestling. There's plenty out there who absolutely love them, including the folks who requested this video and want us to see a bit of their history. So, how about a pro res storyline where a jobber comes good? It doesn't often happen, but one time where it did happen, well, no half measures were taken. It was decided that someone largely based in the undercard and known for losing would not only start winning, but they would earn themselves a main event shot at the heavyweight championship. That's uh, certainly no mean feat. The promotion in question was Pro Wrestling Noah, the year was 2006, and the man in question was Masao Inoue. Actually, it's a surprise such things don't happen more often. The structure of Japanese touring, with a one of about 15 or so shows leading up to a big card at the end, which usually features a title match, does kind of allow for it. It allows for a title challenge to sort of exist in its own little world, and they don't all necessarily have to be huge tussles. It isn't all that uncommon for someone to get elevated up the card just for one tour so they can have a title match, and then go back down. It's just that in this case, the way that Noah did it was quite different and weirdly jobber-centric. What we have here would be absolute manna from heaven for the OSW lads, it has to be said. On the Spring Navigation 2006 tour, Noah ran what can essentially be described as a tournament for their boys. As in the guys who, for the most part, had never had so much as a title shot, let alone a one with a big belt. You've got eight competitors, and they just about all meet good boy standards. Inoue, his Dark Agent stablemate Akitoshi Saito, Rookie Shuhei Taniguchi, who you may know better as Maybuck Taniguchi if you follow Noah, Takuma Sano, Tsuyoshi Kikuchi, Junji Izumida, Kentaro Shiga, and Kishin Kawabata. Akitoshi Saito on balance would probably be the favourite on paper, he'd at least had a title shot in the past. Sano would be second. Masao Inoue? Jeez. You know what, I don't think you'd have even put him in the top four of favourites, out of eight. Still, he had a long history up to this point. He started out in All Japan all the way back in 1991. After nine years of doing not a whole lot except losing in multi-man matches on the arse end of the card, he made the jump to Noah along with almost everyone else in 2000, and then started losing in multi-man matches there too. He wasn't the biggest or the most in shape wrestler, but like any good jobber, he was very good at selling and so on. The crowd did take him in as something of a sentimental favourite due to his sheer longevity and persistence and consistency, despite the absolute inertia of his career up to this point. Although, in this regard, as far as the tournament goes, he probably wasn't as over as, for example, longtime Kabashi friend and tag partner Tsuyoshi Kikuchi. At the time of this tournament, he was paired up with Akitoshi Saito, Takashi Sagura, and Kishin Kawabata in mid-card heel stable, The Dark Agents. 
He was considered second in command for the group behind Saito, although usually either he or Kawabata would be eating the pins. Now I think you're getting a picture here. Even in a tournament with as little star power as this one, Masawa Inoue was not fancied by anyone to actually win. But win, he did. Victories over Shuhei Taniguchi and Takuma Sano bring him to the final, where he defeats Akitoshi Saito by countout. The victory earned him a main event GHC title shot at the end of the tour against Len champion Junaki Yama, fresh off his title win against the much loved Akira Tawe, and apparently finally ready for the long title one people thought he would have already had by this point. Facing Masao Inoue isn't exactly a major match for Junaki Yama. Ordinarily, it's the sort of person that he would expect to dispatch in minutes. And even if these aren't exactly ordinary circumstances, certainly no one's expecting Masao Inoue to pull off any kind of shock here. This is, for all intents and purposes, a stopgap before a bigger opponent on the next tour. I mean, putting the title on Masao Inoue would be nothing short of sheer madness after all, wouldn't it? So, the match itself? Actually, you know what? It's bloody great. Inoue may be overmatched against Akiyama, but he goes all out from the off for the quick victory. He's got the crowd on his side due to being the massive underdog, and they cheer everything he does big time while Akiyama plays the heel and gets booed. Inoue goes through a whole list of wily tricks, wristband burns, rope burns, apron burns. He does all this to the delight of the crowd, and when Akiyama does the same thing, he gets booed, which is hilarious. Inoue goes for the quick roll-ups and gets a pop, and also goes for sneaky count-out wins and gets a pop. A perfectly valid strategy in Puro where titles can change hands on disqualification or count out. If you like the antics of Toru Yano in modern New Japan, you will love Inui here. He is like the prototypical sublime master thief. Ultimately though, he is overmatched. Still, he refuses to give up. Knee after knee for Makiyama isn't enough to put him down, even if he just cannot fight no more. Finally, Akiyama has to use the wrist clutch exploder to defeat Inui once and for all. It's a mighty effort, and Akiyama quite rightly gives Inoue a lot of respect in the post-match for his attempt. Inoue's one shot of the big gold is a little hidden gem of a match from Noah's generally excellent mid-2000s, and I highly recommend you seek it out. Masao Inoue's GHC title shot is, of course, his career high point, but the man's had a long career which continues to this day, largely in Noah, but also for a time back in All Japan. His work ethic and loyalty was rewarded with the GHC title match, and he certainly made the most of the opportunity, even if he was pretty much straight back to the lower part of the card on the next tour. He may not exactly be flashy, but he's got just what's needed for the middle of the card, the odd sneaky antic, the odd bit of comedy, and from time to time the odd little reminder that he can actually go hard and shouldn't be underestimated. His GHC title shot's another great little underdog story, perfect for a single tour, and it certainly made for some fond memories. Let's go back to the WWF in the early 2000s, where our focus isn't so much on the jobbers themselves, but on a guy who didn't seem to have any bloody luck with them. Perry Saturn. Now, I am an unashamed Saturn mark, he's in my boy stable, for sure. The Eliminators were an awesome team in ECW, basically their version of the Steiners, two powerful bastards doing ridiculous moves with little psychology and it being tons of fun. Saturn was still good in WCW, even though he was saddled with some quite ridiculous shit. For someone who most didn't think had too much in the way of charisma, he could still get the crowd on his side even when he was made to wear a skirt. Saturn, of course, arrived in the WWF in early 2000 with three other guys, those guys being Chris Benoit, Eddie Guerrero, and Dean Malenko. After the initial radical storyline and stable fizzled out, he didn't have an awful amount to do. Just another tough man in the midcard, usually found on Heat or Metal or Jacked or wherever. He had a manager in the shape of Terry Runnels, but he didn't have all that much of a gimmick and as such wasn't particularly over. But his struggles with jobbers, quite weirdly, would change all of that. The first jobber incident is quite infamous, and it certainly doesn't reflect well on old Perry. In May 2001, he faced Mike Bell at a metal taping. Everything starts off pretty ordinary, the usual humdrum beginnings to a match and all of that, until there's a botch. There seems to be some confusion between the pair about whether they're doing a hip toss or an arm drag, with the result being that Saturn lands quite awkwardly on his neck. 
In truth, it looks like a simple miscommunication with both guys at fault, six to one, half a dozen of the other. However, Saturn goes absolutely apeshit. He gets right up, smashes Bell with punches and kicks, and then absolutely shit cans him out of the ring, chucking Bell right on his neck. And that's not all. He then gets out of the ring and just picks him up and freaking slams him into the steps. A ridiculously brutal spot that you should never be seeing in a regular jobber squash match. It's around this point that Terry gets in Saturn's ear to calm him down. The rest of the match just about proceeds normally, but yeah, it sure isn't pretty. Regardless of who was at fault for the initial botch, the blame for everything afterwards fully laid with Saturn. Everyone backstage took a very dim view of the incident. While a lot of recaps of this incident tend to describe Mike Bell as a greenhorn, that was far from the case. Bell was a stalwart jobber who'd been pinned and paid in the WWF since 1992, was a trusted hand and well liked by the locker room, more so than Saturn. Saturn, in everyone's eyes, had taken unnecessary liberties. To quote Meltzer from The Observer, he'd done the sort of thing that people generally laughed at when Rick Steiner did it to some poor bastard in WCW 2000, but that dog wasn't going to hunt in the WWF. He was chewed out by the management and told in no uncertain terms that if he ever pulled this shit again, he would be out on his ass. But that wasn't going to be the only punishment. Just a couple of weeks later, on the war, Saturn teams up with Malenko against the APA. I think you know what's coming. Old Testament shit courtesy of the locker rooms enforcers. All progresses normally, with the level of stiffness you would expect from these four, until it's time for Saturn to get his punishment. Which is two of the nastiest, stiffest, kin hell spike power bombs you have ever seen. Just ouch. Jesus Christ. The message is kind of clear here. Don't fuck with a well liked jobber. And that still wouldn't exactly be the end of the punishment. The whole thing gets turned into an angle where Saturn gets a head injury, starts talking weirdly, and then falls in love with a mop which he then starts carrying to Lorin. Good old moppy. And what happens next? Well, the whole thing gets over. The crowd takes to Saturn and his mop and he turns face, much to the frustration of his manager and previous main squeeze. The gimmick, clearly intended as punishment to make Saturn look ridiculous, actually gets cheers. Perhaps simply because it actually gave Saturn a character of sorts which he didn't have before. And again, the guy did have experience with taking lemons and making lemonade, so to speak. Being made to look ridiculous wasn't all that new for Saturn. Perry Saturn and Moppy became a fun and entertaining mid-card act in 2001, at least until Terry put the fin in a wood chipper. But still, Saturn remained face for the rest of his WWF one. However, he wasn't quite done with jobber incidents yet. In December of 2001, at another metal taping, Saturn had a match with a guy named Brian Gamble. Now, unlike Mike Bell, this guy wasn't an experienced jobber and instead had come from Roller Jam with a bit of a martial arts background. Essentially, he was here on tryout. Once again, Finns start off ordinarily, but it's weird. This jobber, this Brian Gamble, keeps trying to lead the match, getting way too much of his terrible redneck through a fencing and being totally uncooperative. Saturn kinda has to keep stiffing him in order to keep him on track. The story goes that this Brian Gamble was in his hometown and he tried to change things in Lorin, saying that he had to win. No, seriously. Now I don't know what would possess you to try and shoot down on someone like Saturn, but this guy tried it. So yeah, things do get quite rough. Saturn may well have had thoughts about the Mike Bell incident and what would happen if he got the blame for this one. He gets stiff but nowhere near the level he got with Bell. Eventually he puts on what appears to be a pretty legit rins of Saturn for the win. You can hear Gamble yelp quite loudly as he taps and I assume that Saturn didn't hold back on it. Now of course all the fault here laid with this Brian Gamble idiot. Amazingly, he acted like an even bigger twat backstage. When Jerry Briscoe asked Gamble what happened, he reiterated that he was in his hometown, his friends and family were there, and he didn't want to lose. He nearly had another fight with Saturn when they were both being treated on, saying that Saturn was lucky that he didn't send him to the emergency room. Seriously? Vince McMahon thought that the guy was utterly nuts, and Earl Hebner ended up throwing him out of the arena. Needless to say, Brian Gamble wasn't ever seen in a WWF or WWE ring again. 
The next week, live on TV, Vince gave Saturn a nod during a segment, essentially a confirmation that this time, Saturn had done the right thing. A few months later, a torn ACL would put an end to Saturn's stint in the company, but well, he certainly had his ups and downs, and weirdly most of it was due to his trouble with jobbers. Sure wasn't boring, that much can be said. We go back to Japan for our next one, but we go there by the way of the UK. Here we're looking at the strange story of a guy who was barely trained and somehow, back in the 90s, managed to parlay what Booker T would call limited skills and ability into promoting some shows, being a jobber in ECW, and ultimately getting his ass kicked by one of Japan's greatest ever juniors in a match that can only be described as a complete fiasco. Let's have a little look at Jason Harrison, otherwise known as the Dirt Bike Kid. The Dirt Bike Kid first surfaced in the wilderness of UK indies in the mid-90s at the head of his own promotion called the EWA. He main evented his first card against… Sabu. Yes, that Sabu. It's a pretty miserable match with even more botches than you'll usually find in a Sabu match. A lot of this has to do with the kid being barely trained. The couple of shows that Dirt Bike Kid ran are somewhat interesting, mind you. They are some of the first indie shows that were very much marketed towards smarks and newsletter readers, at least in the UK, for people who'd know about Sabu in 1995 and were excited to see him come to Europe. This was something different back then, even if they weren't necessarily good shows. Unfortunately, the cost of running them was so large and the audiences so small that well over a year tended to pass between each show, as whenever one was done, the kid had to build up his finances again just to get another one going. All said, however, he did manage to attract folks like Sabu and Rob Van Dam over, along with the odd other hot indie wrestler, or even the odd Puro guy. This bit at least is to his credit. The Dirt Bike Kid did manage to parlay this working relationship with Sabu into an American gig. A few people may know him as a jobber in ECW, possibly for his rather different look more than anything. He'd sometimes be found losing to various wrestlers here and there, usually in defence of his own EWA belt. Despite coming back a fair few times, it doesn't seem that he was particularly well liked. He got a reputation for being quite arrogant backstage despite his skill level, and there are rumours that more than once he was made to change outside of the locker room. To this day, there really aren't too many people who had experience of the dirt bike kid who have all that much good to say about him, although it should be said that this just meant he was a dick in most people's eyes, not that he did anything especially bad. Anyway, right near what would be the end of his career in 1999, we get to the incident he's most famous for. Japanese indie Michinoku Pro, having done some stuff over here in the UK, particularly with the fleetingly on television UWA promotion, decide to invite some UK wrestlers over for one of their Fukumen Masked Man League tournaments. Jason Cross, Jody Fleisch, both very young at this point, and Dirtbike Kid. Dirtbike Kid wasn't a masked wrestler, but then that wasn't necessarily the point. You know, just go over there and do the thing. Be a bit of meat in the room, as the old saying from In The Loop goes. Play the game. But Dirtbike Kid wasn't exactly having that. It's known that before his first match against the great Sasuke, Dirtbike Kid was arguing the toss and saying that he wasn't a masked wrestler and so on. Ultimately, in his mind anyway, he agreed to wear a mask to the ring and then take it off when he got there revealing a smaller, more Dirtbike Kid-esque mouthguard. Apparently, in the words of Peter Ohanwaha Hanwahan, Michinoku Pro didn't like it, but they'd have to go along with it. This is often cited as the main reason for what would happen in the Sasuke match, although the reason itself is probably a bit simpler. Anyway, the kid gets to face the great Sasuke, the owner of Michinoku Pro, one of the best and most decorated juniors around, generally a pretty crazy guy with a short temper, in the first match, and he's going to be jobbing in short order. That's the plan. If you watch the full match back, the reason for it all going on is perhaps more straightforward. Dirtbike Kid does try and get his shit in in the short time that he's got, and it is most certainly shit, kind of backyarder level stuff, but Sasuke does play along and sells it. But then, when it's time for Sasuke to start taking the lead, Dirtbike Kid hardly returns the favour, like he barely sells at all, or if he's trying to sell he's awful at it. Apparently this pissed Sasuke off something that doesn't take much, and he starts throwing shoot kicks in Kid's direction. 
According to Kidd, at least, he took them all like it was nothing until one so happened to hit a cartilage injury, at which point he crumpled. Sasuke aimed a few at the head of his grounded opponent for good measure before picking him up, applying a shoot neck crank front face lock and making Kid tap. All of this only took about two and a half minutes, but the incident remains one of Puro's most infamous matches gone won. In interviews later on, Dirtbike Kid seemed to get a bit of a paranoid streak. He blamed his fellow UK wrestlers for politicking and ruining his reputation with Michinoku Pro. He seems almost blameless in his own retellings of the story, which isn't ever a particularly good sign. He certainly made an impression in his solitary Japan match, that's for sure. He missed the rest of the tournament for injury, but <laughs> yeah, it wasn't a good one. The following year he left the business to try and become a stuntman and yeah, that's kind of it. The Dirt Bike Kid, more than anything, is a fun example of how far you could get back in the 90s even if you weren't necessarily trained all the way or anything like that. Without much in the way of internet or record of his bouts, he could get those gigs in ECW and Michinoku Pro and the like, probably through a little gift of the gap. The shit arsery of the 90s UK indies runs wild here, folks. <laughs>